All right, so we're ready. Last chunk of the electron transport chain where we talk about the chain specifically. I've already given you a general overview of the citric acid cycle to get us all on the same page. Gave you the bird's eye perspective of the electron transport chain in general. We talked about reduction potentials in the last chunk, and hopefully I convinced you of how and why we can get negative delta G's out of these redox reactions. And so let's talk about the electron transport chain itself. There are four protein complexes that are part of the electron transport chain, and they're referred to as respiratory complexes simply because they're part of respiration. All of them are associated with the inner mitochondrial membrane, and so the electron transport chain itself occurs in or at that inner mitochondrial membrane. Also, each of these complexes are multi-enzyme systems, simply meaning that there are many different enzymes working to catalyze different redox reactions in each complex. The first complex is, not surprisingly, called complex 1. It looks like, in general, a fallen over L. It goes by a fancier name, NADH-CoQ oxidoreductase, and I actually encourage you to know this fancier name, not because I'll ask you to memorize it, but because this name tells you more about what's going on with the electrons than complex 1 ever will. We can see from this name that NAD is going to be oxidized, while CoQ is going to be reduced. So this name tells us the path of the electrons. In a nutshell, complex 1 does just that. It transfers electrons from NADH to CoQ. This is an integral protein on the inner mitochondrial membrane. It's stuck at the mitochondrial membrane. And it contains two components that can serve as electron carriers. FMN, which is a flavoprotein. This is one of the electron carriers that we make from the coenzyme riboflavin. And iron sulfur clusters. Both of these, FMN and iron sulfur clusters, are just things that can be reduced and oxidized. They're electron carriers. They can gain or lose electrons. That's all that they are. So at complex 1, Electrons arrive from NADH. They're riding the NADH shuttle. These are the electrons that we harvested in glycolysis, the PDC, and the citric acid cycle. And those electrons are transferred from NADH to FMN, the flavoprotein component of complex 1. In other words, FMN is receiving those electrons and becoming reduced, while NAD is oxidized. That NAD, in its oxidized form, can then shuttle back to the citric acid cycle to pick up another round of electrons. FMN, in its reduced form, then gives up its, its electrons, returning itself to its oxidized form, and passes those electrons on to these iron-sulfur clusters. So the iron-sulfur clusters become reduced. Lastly, in complex 1, the iron-sulfur clusters are oxidized, and they pass the electrons to CoQ. CoQ becomes reduced to CoQH2. That's essentially it for complex 1. So to summarize, electrons are brought to complex 1 riding the NADH plus H shuttle. NADH plus H gives those electrons to FMN. FMN passes those electrons to a series of iron sulfur clusters. And iron sulfur clusters pass those electrons to CoQ. Let's talk about some broader implications here. I already gave you a heads up that we're going to pump protons as part of the electron transport chain, and we're going to do that right away here in complex 1. The redox reactions I just described release a total negative delta G of negative 81 kilojoules per mole. That's a lot of energy, and some of that energy is going to be used to pump protons. The question becomes, what protons are being pumped? Remember, I've told you that all along, when redox reactions occur and electrons are transferred, protons follow. Well, that wasn't entirely true. Hopefully it's helped you up until now. I didn't lie to be mean. I was trying to give you an easier way to see redox reactions. I apologize for betraying your trust. And what I should have said is that in biochemical reactions where electrons go, protons almost always follow. But they don't follow the electrons when it comes to iron sulfur clusters. So when NADH plus H arrives at complex 1, it gives up its electrons and its protons to FMN, and FMN becomes FMNH2. No big deal. FMNH2 then gives up its electrons to iron sulfur clusters, but iron sulfur clusters can't carry protons. So FMN 
releases those protons, and it's those protons that get pumped across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Those two protons get pumped into the inner mitochondrial space. Eventually, the iron sulfur clusters pass those electrons on to CoQ, and CoQ becomes reduced to CoQH2. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Where did those protons come from? The electrons on CoQ came from the iron sulfur clusters, but the iron sulfur clusters did not have protons. Where did those protons come from? Well, those protons came from the mitochondrial matrix, and that further contributes to the proton gradient we're trying to establish. Let's look at this visually, because I'm afraid in words it won't make nearly as much sense. Here are our protons. We are trying to create a proton gradient where there are more protons out here in the inner mito mitochondrial space than in here in the matrix. And when FMNH2 gives up its electrons to the iron sulfur clusters, the iron sulfur clusters do not accept the protons. And so those two protons from FMN get pumped across the inner mitochondrial membrane, like that. We've just established a gradient across that membrane. Then I told you CoQ eventually accepts those electrons from the iron sulfur clusters, but CoQ can carry protons. The protons that CoQ takes, it takes from the mitochondrial matrix. Look how that affects the concentration gradient. The concentration gradient has been enhanced not by the pumping of protons, but by CoQ absorbing protons from the matrix instead of from the inner mitochondrial space. One last point that will become important in just a moment is that CoQ is mobile. Just like NAD, CoQ can move around in the inner mitochondrial membrane, and CoQ is going to carry those electrons somewhere for us. But before we follow those electrons, let's go back to an old friend, Complex 2. Complex 2 will also offload electrons to CoQ, but Complex 2 is succinate CoQ oxidoreductase, an enzyme that transfers electrons from succinate to CoQ. It's bound to the inner mitochondrial membrane. We know this guy much better as succinate dehydrogenase, also an enzyme catalyzing part of the citric acid cycle. This is an old slide from a few lectures ago where we were talking about step six of the citric acid cycle. And I told you that you would have to know this enzyme specifically because it's very important. It does double duty. It not only plays a role in catalyzing the formation of succinate to fumarate, it also is part of the electron transport chain and carries harvested electrons on FAD when reduced FADH2. We are now here looking at succinate dehydrogenase as part of the electron transport chain, where we refer to it as complex 2. Those electrons that we left on FADH2 way back in step 6 of the citric acid cycle will now offload those to CoQ. FADH2 is oxidized. Its electrons are passed to iron sulfur clusters. This time there's not enough energy to actually pump protons out of the matrix. But when those iron sulfur clusters pass those electrons on to CoQ, CoQ will become CoQH2, and the, and the protons that CoQ absorbs will come from the matrix, contributing to the gradient in the way we just described. So now we're ending at a merger point, where we have the electrons harvested by complex 1 sitting on CoQ, and the electrons harvested by complex 2 sitting on CoQ and we'll soon follow CoQ to see where it goes next. Also, it's important to point out that we have a little bit of a middleman here in complex two. That middleman is a cytochrome. We'll see cytochromes emerge again in just a moment. But for those of you who are taking uh, biochemistry lab here with Dr. RC, you will also see that these cytochromes are the same cytochromes you're working with in your lab exercises. Cytochromes, as some of you may know, are proteins that contain a heme group, a porphyrin, porphyrins that were made from succinate directly, but these porphyrin heme groups do not carry oxygen. Instead, the iron in these heme groups can be oxidized or reduced, which means they carry electrons. 
So for our purposes, these cytochromes are just another electron carrier in the electron transport chain, another thing to play hot potato with those electrons. What makes cytochromes special is that they make up a large protein family of electron carriers. Different cytochromes have different reduction potentials, and so different cytochromes can be used to release different energies with different delta Gs. And we can see that here in this table we've looked at before. We have different forms of cytochrome A, different forms of cytochrome C, which is the one that is being used in the lab of this course. We have a cytochrome B, uh, so lots of cytochromes play a role here. <clears throat> we won't go into much more detail than that. So now it's on to complex three. Well, regardless of where those electrons came from, either complex one or complex two, electrons arrive at complex three on CoQH2. So CoQH2 shuttles electrons from complex one to complex three and from complex two to complex three. Complex three is also bound to the inner mitochondrial membrane and briefly it catalyzes the transfer of electrons from CoQH2 to cytochrome C, our last mobile electron carrier. CoQ can carry two electrons, iron can only carry one, and so we actually have this weird game that's played where two cytochromes are needed for every one CoQ. If we're going to oxidize CoQ and reduce cytochromes, we need to offload the electrons one at a time. Also, cytochromes, much like iron sulfur clusters, cannot carry protons. So here again, the protons from CoQH2 are going to be pumped from CoQH2 out of the matrix and into the inner membrane space, just as we saw for complex one. So let's follow this kind of complicated path of electrons where CoQ is carrying two, but we can only offload one at a time. CoQ is unique for electron carriers in that it can pass only one electron at a time, and that's important because that's all that can accept it on the cytochrome side. First, one electron is passed to an iron sulfur cluster in complex three, and then eventually on to cytochromes. Then another fully reduced CoQH2 passes a single electron to iron sulfur clusters, which eventually make their way to cytochrome C. And that leaves us with two half oxidized CoQH molecules, each one having offloaded a single electron. It appears, it hasn't been fully determined yet, but it appears as though at this point, one of those half reduced CoQHs fully reduces the other, leaving us with one CoQH2 and one CoQ. This is a lot to digest. It's hard for me to conceptualize this. If you're confused, and I imagine a number of you will be pointed out in your reflection, I have a, a demonstration that I can do which should clear a lot of this up. But essentially, imagine if you're holding two balls, you can only give up one ball at a time. If you pass one ball over, you're holding on to only one ball now. That's one electron. You as CoQ, you cannot pass the second ball for whatever reason. Instead, another twin of yours must come with two balls, pass one ball themselves. Now each of you is carrying one ball, and only then can your twin hand you their remaining ball, fully reducing you to CoQH2 and fully oxidizing them to CoQ. That's the idea of it. And that's what's shown here as well. CoQH2 arrives, it offloads one electron, that reduces cytochrome C, and then we need another CoQ to come and offload a second electron. Why it's done this way and not more straightforwardly is still unknown, but it is under study. Scientists are trying to determine why this mechanism needs to exist. That brings us to complex four, also called cytochrome C oxidase, also part of the inner mitochondrial membrane. Complex four catalyzes the final steps of the electron transport chain and we will transfer the electrons from the mobile carrier cytochrome C to oxygen. Complex four also pumps protons directly as a proton pump out of the matrix and into the inner mitochondrial space. Just as complex three is complicated, complex four is quite simple. Cytochrome C transfers its electrons. Remember, it's only carrying electrons, no protons. 
It transfers its electron to a pair of cytochrome A proteins, and those pair of cytochrome A proteins make up a complex called cytochrome oxidase. Copper is involved in the middle as a temporary holding place for electrons, but cytochrome oxidase is oxidized directly by oxygen. It's the oxygen that accepts those electrons in the end. This is why we breathe. That oxygen itself is reduced. It accepts electrons, but you'll notice no protons have been moved anywhere in complex four. Oxygen becomes water. Those protons come from the matrix, just as we've seen before. Schematically, reduced cytochrome C arrives at complex four, offloads its electron, becomes oxidized. Copper holds the, that electron briefly, passes it to some iron sulfur clusters, and then that electron is passed on to oxygen, reducing oxygen to create water. I mentioned it a moment ago, but reducing oxygen in this way contributes to the proton gradient because that oxygen, as it accepts two electrons from two subsequent iron sulfur clusters, it absorbs protons as a result of that reduction from the matrix. It further contributes to the proton concentration gradient by reducing the number of protons in the matrix, but perhaps more importantly, oxygen when reduced and protonated is water and that water is released. How is that water released? Well we can see it on any cold New England day. The water vapor in your exhalate, the water vapor that you exhale, is the water created by this very last step of the electron transport chain. At this point we've milked all of the conceivable energy we possibly can out of glucose. We've used all of these redox reactions, carefully and successively staged, from NAD all the way to water, to release an abundant amount of energy. And all that energy we released has largely been used to pump and absorb protons, creating a proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. We now have a gradient where protons are dying to flow back into the matrix, but they can't because they've been walled off from doing so by the dam of the inner, inner mitochondrial membrane. These protons can't flow without a channel that lets them through. And what we will do in oxidative phosphorylation is open that channel, open the floodgates, and let those protons flow. And as those protons flow, we will harness that kinetic energy of proton motion, and it's that energy we will use to make ATP. But I don't want to spoil it. All that will have to wait until the next lecture, lecture 16, oxidative phosphorylation. To summarize the electron transport chain schematically, electrons arrived at complex one on the mobile electron carrier NADH plus H. Those electrons were offloaded to FMN, which accepted the protons, transferred to iron sulfur clusters, the protons were pumped, and eventually CoQ was reduced, absorbing protons from the matrix. Those protons and electrons were then migrated to complex three, where we had this wacky trading one electron at a time method until eventually we reduced cytochrome C with single electrons. So the electrons moved from complex one to complex three using the CoQ shuttle. The electrons that we harvested on succinate dehydrogenase in the citric acid cycle were lying on FADH2, they were also offloaded to a CoQ shuttle, and eventually they could make their way to complex three as well. Either way, complex three ended with the reduction of cytochrome C. Cytochrome C arrives at complex four, where the electron is offloaded, protons are pumped, and eventually oxygen is reduced to water. All of that done to pump protons to create the proton concentration gradient and to create a gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. What we do with that gradient will be discussed and described as we move on to the next lecture.